Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in 3, 2, 1. On this week's episode, could Anthem be the key to Bioware's future? Our update on antiheroes, and we conclude our thoughts on CES. All this and more as we once again delve into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the pop culture cosmos. And we're back with another episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great programs. But it wouldn't be a Pop Culture Cosmos without my good friend. He is the lead javelin of Humanica Media. You got to check out everything that's going on today at HumanicaMedia.com, Humanica Media on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and so much more. It is my good friend. It is Josh Peterson. Are you all amped up? Because Anthem is coming out this Tuesday. You know, I was going to make a story of the year joke because I have that song called Anthem of our dying day, but I don't think anyone would understand it. So, yes, man, I'm good. I'm I'm amped. I am not sure when I'm going to play Anthem, but I'm I'm interested. You know, it looks pretty good. Well, we'll talk about that in just a second here. But I just wanted to mention to everyone out there that coming up on today's program, Raw McCallum is stopping by to step into the middle of the Cosmic Crossfire as he and I weigh in on the potential real ramifications of the upcoming Disney-Fox merger. We also want to close out our look at CES this year with interviews with the great folks at Cavalier Audio, Blue Microphones, Snackbot, Phone Soap, and THX. And we're going to play all those interviews coming up in the back half of the episode. Plus, also as well, Josh and I are going to give you an update on what's going on with the anti-heroes. I know we discussed it a little bit in detail on the PCZ multiverse. I was worried about the direction of where these anti-hero shows were going and the fact that they were all coming out around the same time and all being developed and thought they would lose their luster. But as Josh and I will explain later in the episode, that may not be the case just yet. But first, we want to talk about what's coming out this week, and that starts with none other than Anthem that's coming out on Tuesday. A lot of big hype for this game. In fact, there was actually a hype live-action video directed by Neil Blomkamp, who is best known for District 9. He actually made a almost like what you could say is a short film promoting some of the backstory behind Anthem, Anthem is coming out as a basically a cooperational game in the vein of Destiny and Destiny 2. Four heroes set out to go ahead, mission after mission, to try and do what they can to save their community and save their planet from all the evil monsters and, and terrible things that lurk out there on the planet that they're on. Your thoughts on Anthem first off? What have you seen of it so far that you liked? And what are some of the things that you're kind of maybe apprehensive about or even curious about as it leads into the release this Tuesday? It looks like a beautiful game. Like it looks like something that only Bioware could deliver. Like the way the world is built, the way that you interact with the environment, the way that, uh, you know, even watching the videos of like how the javelin splashes into the water. And so you're in a completely different world down there. And then the way, it looks inside the city and you can talk to people. That's all really cool. Game looks very beautiful. I guess my, my, my reservations about it is that it looks like it's trying too hard to be Destiny meets Monster Hunter. Bioware is good at coming up with original content. They're not good at knocking off other games, but it seems like this is something that EA decided would be a good concept and they put Bioware on it. From what I understand, the, when you interact with people, 
it doesn't shape your story at all. Like there's not really much of a story besides the story of the game. Like, you know, you're fighting for survival. You know, they tell legends of whatever you are and how you how you save the world once. And now you have to bring those people's reputation back up as you try to save the world again. But it doesn't sound like there's much of a uh, interactive story from that point. You're just going out and doing missions. And yeah, you talk to people in the city, but that's that's really it. So it's, it's a Bioware game, but it's not really a Bioware game. And I do want to play it. I want to try playing with Big Dog and Brian Kane and see what's what. But it's not something I'm in a rush to play. Because it, it's still, I don't know, it's just not something that I am excited about. I love Bioware, but I don't really love this concept that much. I agree with you on that. And let's get everybody up to speed. The Javelins that I actually quoted you as earlier in the episode, that's the basis for the type of suit and armor that you take out when you go ahead and venture out into the planet and face off against the monsters at. Is that correct? Yeah, so the javelins are like your Iron Man suits, and you get to cut. There's, from what I understand, there's an infinite amount of ways that you can customize your javelin. If there's certain colors, certain schemes, certain weapons, like you can customize anything on this javelin. It's like a an Iron Man suit crossed over with a Gundam, and that's cool. Like I love that concept, but really, once you have the javelins on, it seems like your character is just a multiplayer character after that. And The game is, like you said, very multiplayer-centric, multiplayer-focused as far as you and three other individuals. If you try to play it solo, I think it just tries to lean you and force you into going ahead and playing with others to make it more of an enjoyable experience because it wants to promote that teamwork concept type deal. And I just think at this point in time, it's looking very much like Destiny And we've seen what happens with Destiny, where it came out to mediocre to okay reviews, and it actually generated a a lot of enthusiasm at the time. And Destiny 2 obviously was created from that initial enthusiasm, but it never really garnered and sold to the point where I think where Activision and Bungie were happy with. So obviously we've seen in the past couple months where Bungie has now separated from Activision because of the declining returns that they got from Destiny 2, where the reviews still remained that, okay, pretty good type deal, but never really landed them that acclaim, both from a consumer and also from a critical standpoint, that I think they were really garnering and trying to level up against their past when it comes to the Halo trilogy that they're also known for, that they worked on, for quite some time before they handed it over to 343. It just seems like at this point in time that maybe Bioware is coming up with a concept here in Anthem that may be a little bit outdated, that wasn't entirely successful, depending on how much it emulates the type of concept that Destiny had to offer. And is it similar in that vein? Yes, it is very similar to it. The difference as far as a third-person to first-person shooting experience, Destiny is primarily a first-person shooting experience, whereas Anthem is mostly from the perspective of over-the-shoulder. So be that as it may, it still looks like something that I think a lot of people are going to emulate. Like you said, with a dash of Monster Hunter and the success of that game from last year, it looks like it's trying to emulate some of that success as well. It's not exactly original, You do have to go and get your storylines and your mission concepts from a central hub location that you're trying to protect. In essence, I'm not sure I'm going to enjoy playing Anthem as well as I would many other Bioware games. And obviously this comes off the fact that EA doesn't really have a full 100% focus on Anthem, even though it's provided obviously a much larger commercial and marketing budget than they did Apex Legends, because right now, The success is all in Apex Legends lap, and could that step in the way of what potential success could be down the road for Anthem? Yes, for sure, because it's a free-to-play game, and look how many players it's already scooped up. Uh, People are excited about Anthem. You know, the guys uh, at Kind of Funny and Giant Bomb have been talking about it nonstop, so I think that they're excited about it. But what's, I don't know, what's interesting about it is that it, it feels like it was kind of an afterthought to a changing market, if that makes sense. Everything online all the time, that kind of connectivity where you, you play with your friends, like you're, you're, there's no 
it, it was made during that debate about single player games fading out. And Bioware has now announced a new Dragon Age. They've been talking about Mass Effect. So what kind of I'm, I'm curious, what kind of manpower was invested into this game? Well, I can tell you it was obviously a lot more than what was devoted to in Mass Effect Andromeda because we've heard and read stories about the failure of Mass Effect Andromeda and the fact that so much attention and manpower was diverted to Anthem specifically. Right, but Bioware is a small studio, so think about if they took the entire um, you know veteran staff of Bioware and put them on Star Wars, but Anthem is also a Bioware game, but it's a game that re- would require a full studio to to keep running much like Bungie has with Destiny and then they're also working on a new Dragon Age and a new Mass Effect so I, I'm curious exactly how much manpower this game had and how much support it's going to have moving forward especially with them working on so many other projects or is it possible that EA has some kind of backup staff working on this game and they're just using BioWare's reputation to put the game out who knows who knows but It is kind of perplexing that they would target having Apex Legends come out within the same month, same period of time as Anthem, which is obviously costing EA a ton of money to go ahead and produce, which is also going to put as well Bioware's name on the line. And that's something I also want to talk to you about. The success, future, and ongoing for Bioware Is there a possibility after the failure of Mass Effect Andromeda that Bioware's success or Bioware continuing as far as as an entity could be hindered, could be altered, or could be damaged with another underwhelming performance with Anthem, both critically and then also from a financial standpoint as well? Because like you said, a Dragon Age could be in the offering very soon. They were also quoted in a major feature article on Polygon that there is a Mass Effect on the way. But your thoughts on what possible damage could be done if Anthem doesn't meet up to the standards that EA obviously has for it. Oh, okay. Well, that's a, that's a whole other bag of cats right there. We you know, got time, man. We got time. Because we've seen what happened with Visceral Games, right? So Visceral Games had the love of the people. You know, Dead Space was an excellent game. They were working on a Star Wars game. And not only did they lose a Star Wars game, they got shut down. EA is, is while I see, you know, that they're trying to climb back into the good graces of the fans, they are a cutthroat company. So if Bioware doesn't perform, again, I guess with Anthem, it, it, could, it could go two different ways. It could end with Bioware getting cut off of EA or getting closed down because... In that situation, I'm pretty sure they can't reopen again, and then we won't get any more Mass Effect or Dragon Age games, in which case everyone will hate EA even more, or EA will move out of the business of making these big multiplayer games and only work on games like Apex Legends. What that would mean for Bioware would hopefully mean that they can go back to doing what they're good at, and and that's telling single-player story-driven games. I hope so. Maybe they would even have to do something that, like what Bungie had to do and separate themselves from EA if they're financially able to do so in order to go ahead again and create those magical single story adventures. But EA is such a bigger company than Activision is, and that would be really difficult for them. And I don't think that that would be a good split unless there was something that both parties agreed to. You think EA is that much bigger than Activision? Yeah, I do, because look at the games that EA puts out yearly, all the Maddens and the sports games. I'm As far as big companies go, I think EA is up there. Okay, I also think Activision's up there, because you got to remember, they've got a little bit of that action coming from Blizzard. They, you know, they've got, So they've got all the Blizzard stuff there as well, and Activision, like I said, they're, they're no slouch with that little indie Call of Duty title they bring out each and every year. But all right, you say apples, I say oranges. You say oranges, I say apples. It's all the same thing. They're both looking up right now at Fortnite. But maybe in the case of EA, it may not be much longer with Apex Legends. But that's another thing I want to ask you. How many times this week are you going to read or hear from somebody, why do I want to go and pay $60 for a Destiny clone when I can play a fast action game like Apex Legends for free? Why should I pay money for something when I can get something for free? You're always going to run into that issue. It almost feels in a way like AAA titles are 
being pushed aside in favor of like cell phone games you know like the cell phone games are free apex legends is free fortnite is free video games are becoming cell phone games and that kind of makes me sad so that leaves it in the hands of the developer right you have to create something that's so great that you're going to want to make people actually want to pay for it and again you know this is what makes services like uh games pass so great too is that you don't necessarily have to pay full price because if you notice, like we are living in a time where nobody wants to pay for anything. Everybody's penny pinchers, myself included. Like nobody wants to pay full price for anything. And that is, I don't want to say that it's sad, but it it's kind of sad. You know, Resident Evil 2 is a perfect example of how to do this correctly because you, you make this game and it gets good word of mouth and people go out and pay $60 for it. So uh, it can be done, but it just has to be done well. What kind of success do you think it's going to have with gamers out there? The reviews are starting to trickle in. Most of them, I, I want to say, are what people are, th- are expecting of it. Okay, pretty good. Some glitches here, some issues there. It does have its fun moments. It does have its similarities to, like you said, Monster Hunter that you very astutely pointed out to, and also the obvious Destiny as well. But your thoughts long-term on Anthem, because I'm not as high on it as everybody else is, and the fact that Anthem, because you brought it out so soon around Apex Legends, not to mention whatever Battlefield Five is going to do with a Battle Royale next month that is scheduled, or at least on the horizon, your thoughts long-term on Anthem, could this have been another case where EA just didn't give Bioware enough to make it a successful game? Yeah, for sure. Just look at the look at the trouble that it had coming out the gate with the um the beta and all that, or the the release to journalists or the EA early access. Like there's been nothing reported about this game coming out and it being smooth at all. Everything has had negative publicity regarding this game. So uh, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't read any reviews uh, straight up right now. And I don't actually know how they're going to review this because it is kind of a game in motion. So uh, will it be reviewed as a multiplayer game? Because that's what Polygon, IGN, these, these uh, pages are doing now. So I have not heard great things about the way that's released. I've heard that it's a fun game, but it seems to have some rough patches. But I've also heard that about Apex Legends. So I think that gamers with this type of thing are more forgiving when it comes to processing issues because of course there's going to be patches later on allegedly and when the embargo doesn't get lifted until monday that also is of great concern to me i really think that's a sign that maybe they don't have they being ea doesn't have the greatest faith in the world of anthem because let's take uncharted series for instance those games are reviewed well in advance and those reviews are put out well in advance because Sony has nothing but the greatest faith in that series and other games as well. I've seen they're just two, three weeks ahead of time. You see the review scores and old tradition holds, whether it's gaming TV or film, that if the reviews are only put out right before or right on the day of release, it tells me that they just don't have the full 100% confidence in the actual product itself. But last thing I want to touch on when it comes to Bioware as a whole you actually said yourself, and also the feature article that was there on Polygon noted that there is a future that consists of Dragon Age and Mass Effect. How reassured were you when you heard and read those thoughts that there will be a future, hopefully, for Mass Effect and for Dragon Age? As you know, as seeing I'm wearing Mass Effect here and I've got Shepard right behind me, you know how big a fan I am of the Mass Effect series before Mass Effect Andromeda. So I want to hear your thoughts. What is your outlook when you saw and read those inferences that a Mass Effect and a Dragon Age could still be around the corner? Oh, well, I was excited, I guess. Like, I I do love those games, but my faith in EA and EA as a backer of BioWare has made me significantly less excited about those games. You know, after all the stuff with Andromeda, like, I still don't hate them. But I have so little faith that they're going to make a successful game as long as they're attached to EA that it's hard for me to go into anything they're about to do excitedly. But because Dragon Age and Mass Effect are good fallback plans, you know, if all else fails and they put all the time and resources into Mass Effect Dragon Age to get 
you know, kind of bring back the magic of what the game was, that's a perfect way for them to make money, for them to come back into the game and be strong and really earn EA their money back. But EA just needs to learn how to how to give them the support that they need and stop doing stupid crap, you know, stop taking uh, seasoned developers who are good at Mass Effect and putting them on things like Star Wars, other projects. They need to stop spreading their developers so thin at EA. And I think once they do that, then they could, they do have the potential to make something good. And again, like uh, this is my concern with Anthem is how thin are the developers spread on this project? That is very well said, my friend. I couldn't said it better myself. Thank goodness we pay you for doing that and pay you very handsomely in Monopoly dollars. I know, and even those checks bounce sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. But I'm not sure it's going to be displayed in full force this time around when it comes to Anthem. My sincere hope is that a new Dragon Age and hopefully a new Mass Effect will be on the way, regardless of whether Anthem is a success or is not the success that EA was hoping for. What are your thoughts out there on Anthem? Are you excited for it? Are you planning on going ahead and delving into the world that is known as Anthem? Did you like the live action trailer that was made by Neil Blomkamp and the movie and all the efforts that EA is putting into it, especially after what EA has done with Apex Legends just a couple weeks ago? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as well. We've got Rob McCallum standing by in the middle of the Cosmic Crossfire. Plus, also as well, on the back end of the show, we're going to be talking to a lot of great people as we close out our interviews for this year from CES. And then Josh and I are going to be talking on the back end a little bit more about CES and then also re getting into that conversation, what we did on Friday's show when it comes to the anti heroes because there's some good programming coming up if you haven't watched it already. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. Looking for an edge the next time you take on your favorite video game? Then check out Vitabrace High Performance Gamer Wristbands. Packed with the power of fruit seed oil, Vitabrace is clinically proven to help improve performance, giving you a better gaming experience. Head to MiracleFruitOil.com and use the promo code MEDIA10 to get $10 off your Vitabrace purchase. Whether you're looking to beat the time on your latest speedrun or are fighting your way to the top on your favorite multiplayer or battle royale, Vitabrace can help you reach your gaming goals. Buy Vitabrace today at MiracleFruitOil.com. That's MiracleFruitOil.com. Vitabrace. Win with it. And we're back with another edition of the Cosmic Crossfire. But it wouldn't be a Cosmic Crossfire without my good friend. He is the man behind Rob McCallum Films and in front of as well, as he would say. You got to check out everything going on at robmccallumfilms.com. Also as well, Rob McCallum Films on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. He's all over the place. Rob McZob. You got to find him. He's out there. And he's posting a lot of great new content because he's got a lot of great things to announce. It is my good friend. It is Rob McCallum. So pray tell, Rob, what's on your mind when it comes to pop culture? Well, the big number that I saw floating around the interweb today was 4,000. And this is, of course, the amount of jobs that could be lost as a result of a Disney Fox merger that isn't official yet, but we know it's heading down to that path. Uh, and these job losses are particularly going to be felt in the marketing, distribution, and home entertainment divisions. And I just wonder, you know, when, when this was announced, you and I had a lot of talks about this, the pros and cons. And we, we had mentioned some of this. But is this and these 4,000 jobs really the tip of the iceberg of the, of the dark side, pun intended, of this merger? None of the other major acquisitions that Disney had, including Pixar and Marvel, you know, had this kind of result these these kind of redundancies as they're calling them so is this the tip of the iceberg and you know is getting x-men and fantastic four into the mcu with these four thousand people losing their jobs well obviously you're you're very sad when you see anybody losing their jobs but unfortunately that is part of what this business 
is all about because we've seen it before with other companies acquiring other companies. Like for instance, Spotify just purchased two different podcast outlets, including one of ours, Anchor. I expect some redundancies there and I expect them to go ahead and, and maybe what whatever they want to do as far as to solidify it all. Unfortunately, some people might be at risk there. I mean, that that is just part of the the, I guess, the way it goes in the business world when a bigger fish goes ahead and chews up a smaller fish. In this case, this is a big fish chewing up an almost as big fish, but not quite. It's all about redundancies, I guess. And I guess Disney is just not willing to go ahead and, and move them or find other uses for these people. It is a sad and almost concerning part of the, the equation here. But you know, and I talked about it for, for a long time as far as speculating on this merger. Did we like it? Did we not like it? But at some, you know, at this point in time, you gotta say, hey, it's happening. It is a done almost a done deal, anyways. And it's unfortunately that is a byproduct of what this is all about. And we've seen it when it comes to media outlets. We've seen it when it comes to mergers of anything in any industry where a bigger fish swallows up a smaller fish. And we see if there's any type of redundancies instead of trying to creatively find ways to find pathways for new new positions and ways that they can still be useful. The easy way out is always taken by these larger companies. Right. And we had talked a lot, you know, about this merger when we first heard it, like what was going to happen and, and, and how was it going to trickle down and what was going to be the new structure and, and where was the divide going to be? Would projects get canceled? Would new ones get greenlit as a result of different capital being around and the strate strategic partnering and placement that Disney has within the industry? What I think is really interesting about this is this is the first real decision that's coming. It's not speculation anymore. It's not the guessing game. This, is, I mean, 4,000 is an estimate, of course. And, you know, it is understandable that there are overlaps with marketing distribution and, and home entertainment in particular. But this is the first real kind of impact. And the other impacts that people were speculating on were number of releases. Are those going to shrink so that uh, we're seeing less and less content get made. Is it going to just be content that's pushed to different things? Disney Plus is coming out. Surely there's got to be a lot of job vacancies or, or opportunities on that side of things, especially if they're going to go compete with uh, Netflix. So yeah, I wonder where, where this is, is really happening and how it's shifting and what the other real touchstones are going to be once this kind of goes through. Is the industry going to completely change, as some people forecasted, with Disney being such a dominant player? Or is it just going to be the absorption of another media with content what they want and basically creating what they want without too much of an impact in the way that they you know, essentially absorbed Marvel and absorbed Pixar without really changing the status quo? And you know, as always, time will tell, but... I think that this is going to be much more drastic. I think we're going to see less content because an entire studio is being erased. And I think we're going to see a lot of battles, especially on the theatrical side uh, with what gets released and how it gets released. And you're going to see a bigger shift than we, than we've been talking about in the last 20 years for, for the home entertainment side versus the theatrical side. And that's something that's a new equation in all this, because there used to be, as you know, and you were familiar with, there used to be a separate industry between made for video movies that were just pushed straight to video. The quality, the production values were never there as compared to what a bigger budgetary concern for either a TV series or a movie theatrical release was concerned. Now you've got a situation, like you said, where they're quite possibly could be less releases due to the merger and the Fox side of things getting slowly and slowly absorbed and producing less and less. I do know FX from the comments that Bob Iger was saying is still going to be a major part of the equation, at least for now. Other entities that Disney has and F, uh, Fox has, as far as what's being sold out, the uh, the Fox Sports, I guess it's up to those, those entities have to be sold off. Freeform, what is their status going forward as far as from the Disney output? Is there a need for a Disney Channel, a Freeform, other stations like that that Disney has in the offering? Are they just going to go ahead and have these mega channels when it comes to ESPN, FX, ABC, and just go ahead and go with that and run with that and add a plus to everything if you want to go ahead and get all the extra content that's going to be available because of it? So. Uh, it's all up in the air, my friend, but I think Disney does have a plan in place. 
it's not going to be pretty to a lot of people, but it is going to be something that in the long run is most likely going to be effective for Disney and its shareholders. And that ultimately is what counts in the world of Disney is are they running at a profit and are they doing something that they think long term is going to be beneficial for the Disney consortium. Once again, it is Rob McCallum, the director of Action Figures, the most powerful toy in the universe. You got to check all the info out as it becomes available on robmccallumfilms.com. Rob McCallum Films on Facebook, at Rob McZob, not Pokey Rob, but at Rob McZob on Twitter, and so much more. Rob, it's always great to have you on the show. Great to have you on the Pop Culture Cosmos, and of course, right here in the middle of the Cosmic Crossfire. Rob McCallum Films is back with a vengeance. Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, which chronicles the ultimate 80s billion dollar franchise, Masters of the Universe. See exclusive interviews and hear untold stories from the people responsible for creating the world of Eternia, a place full of magic and science, and learn about the craft of creating action figures and animation. Power of Grayskull is just one of our many projects at Rob McCallum Films. All right, we're back once again at CS 2019. It's Gerald Glasser from the Pop Culture Cosmos here. I'm here with Scott Finlow from PepsiCo. Actually, he uh, and uh, his great crew that's out here, they actually kind of caught me by surprise because I'm leaving the press room and they said, do you want a snack? I said, sure. Do you want a snack from a robot? I said, absolutely. They're here right now. They've got a cute little snack bot with a lot of fresh goodies inside and I'll tell you what it's just truly interesting the concept which you were talking about but tell me more Scott about the great things that's going on with snack bot sure you know we're excited we have just launched the first CPG branded robot that's delivering convenient food and beverage to anyone in the US so we're excited about being first in this regard and what SnackBot does is it really recognizes the emerging trend that consumers have, and in particular students have, for healthier snacks and beverages to meet their pack schedules, their busy lives, and the needs that they have. It also recognizes that their expectations are for high levels of convenience and that they're doing everything with mobile. So the way SnackBot works is it's app-based. There's a SnackBot app you can download from the Apple Store. Just download it, sign up. And then what you do is anytime you're ready for that snack, you've got that need, you just open it up, pick the items you want. We've got a range of great beverages as well as snacks like Pure Leaf Tea and Starbucks Cold Brew and Bubbly and Life Water and Smart Food, Delights and Sun Chips. You pick a location on campus to have it delivered to. There are 50 plus locations on campus, so it's super convenient. And then the app basically gives you an ETA heads in your direction and when it arrives, lets you know, you go over, open it up, pop the lid, take your items out, close the lid, that triggers payment and you're good to go. So the students have been super excited about it. The university has been an amazing partner and uh, we're really excited about the partnership that we've got with Robbie Technologies who make the robot and what we're off to. So we're, we got a lot to learn. We're excited about it and uh, we're having a lot of fun too. And uh, yeah, that's SnackBot. Well, I'll tell you what, when it comes to SnackBot, I, I can just tell that everybody at the campus of the University of Pacific is having a great time with it. But I know you've got some bigger ideas and bigger plans when it comes to SnackBot on the ideal uses for it, as far as larger venues or even popular venues as well. <laughs> yeah, we've got some great, we certainly have some, uh, you know, some, some thoughts about where we'd love to go with it. Right now, we're just starting our test at the University of the Pacific, so we do have a lot to learn. We're pretty focused at this point on getting the user experience right. What's the portfolio? How's the delivery working? How's the app working? Like I said, the students have been in our limited testing so far really enthusiastic. They are engaged. We've hired them as ambassadors to help us out. So we're going to let them help us build out the proposition uh, on campus, learn there, and then, yeah, we'll... Uh, We'll take it from there. We'll see where it goes. But, you know, we're hopeful that SnackBot will be rolling in locations beyond the University of Pacific in the future. Stay that, tuned. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome to hear. And I, if anybody wants to find out more information, do they go through a certain, certain website? Do the University of Pacific itself? How do they find out more information about SnackBot? Yeah, I mean, the best way is probably to jump online, download the app, see what's available, see what the experience looks like. Both iOS and Google Play, or...? It's actually Apple only at this okay. point, so we'll see as we test and learn. We'll certainly look at expanding, but right now it's Apple only. 
And uh, yeah, the students are the ones who get to have the real first-hand experience right now and uh, on the campus, and yeah, the rest will take it from there. Just seeing it go around, it grabs attention, sparks conversation. It seems like a lot of great things going on as far as SnackBot is concerned. Great. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you as well, Scott. Just truly a pleasure to have you on the show and part of the Pop Culture Cosmos. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. We are back here once again at Pepcom and CES 2019. You know what? I feel a little bit cavalier because I'm at Cavalier Audio. I'm here with Isaac Ashkenazi. And I want to know real quick, what is so great about what's going on at Cavalier Audio? So what's so great about Cavalier Audio is that we're one of a kind in a market that is unbelievably saturated. My brother and I started this company, this brand, with the intention to bring our full passion of fashion and music to the audio industry. And we believe that passion cannot be recreated, and that's how we feel we stand out. Cavalier Audio is three months old currently. The parent company is Sound Design, which also is affiliated with iHome, which is, has been in our family for about 60 years. So with that heritage, we felt it necessary to bring our passion of fashion and materials to the audio industry. So our products right now that launched about three months ago are made up of all genuine globally sourced materials. The leather is genuine and vegetable dyed. The acoustical knit is indigo dyed and from Japan. The metals are aluminum and machine edge cut. And the, our home system is Brazilian walnut wood. And the speakers are 20 watts. You know, they, all the speakers connect to each other, which gives a real full-bodied sound, which we very much care about, as both of us are musicians. And that's the story with Cavalier. Our ambitions are high. Our friends are artists and designers, and we plan to collaborate with anybody that holds true to their passion and what's in their heart in terms of expression. Now, I'm looking at your units here that you have right here on display here at CES 2019. And I'll tell you what, first thing is that they are eye catchers. They're very stylish, very unique, and like you were talking about, in a inundated world when it comes to audio is concerned, where it's just overflowing with audio stuff all over the place, yours seem to stand up because it really adds a sense of style from what I'm seeing right here. What is, what is the feedback that you're getting from just audio files and also the regular consumers at large? So the regular consumers at large, we're getting great feedback, you know, in terms of design and in terms of sound. Like you just mentioned, they stand out in a very saturated world of audio. My brother Albert can actually speak more about what we're hearing from different press from all over the globe. Tom's Guide put us on their top 10 list. You know, I think Forbes said that we were the most beautiful speaker that they've ever seen. And these are quotes. You know, you can go on our website, CavalierAudio.com, and see all of our press, all the quotes. Just thank the universe for bringing us all together and, you know, bringing us all this so far success. Now, Isaac or Albert, I hope you, one of you can answer this question because I'm pretty sure you can. You mentioned CavalierAudio.com, but is that where the best place to go to find out more about all the great Cavalier products, or is there other places where people can buy your awesome Cavalier audio products? So definitely CavalierAudio.com is where, you know, that's our, you know, blueprint our products. You can hear about the press, you can hear about the materials, um, the lifestyle of the, of the brand. And it's available on BestBuy.com. It's available on Amazon.com, and you know, mostly digital right now. That's awesome. You know, still Amazon, BestBuy.com. That's two places. Great, great, great places to start. As far as for anybody looking at a, you know, just a tremendously stylish and unique. This fits a lot of nice bookshelves. If somebody has really a nice home that they really want to decorate with some fine furniture, but also some audio equipment as well, they really need to look at Cavalier Audio because. I'm telling you right now, as if you look on our social media, because I'm going to have some pictures, this really is something that, for, for somebody that's really into elegant design as far as everything, including their audio, looks like Cavalier Audio is the place to go, right? Sounds great, yes, thank you. Albert, Isaac, Ashkenazi, just been great talking to you both, and just great having you part of the Pop Culture Cosmos today, right here from the Cavalier Audio booth at CES 2019. All right, we're back right here at Pepcom and CES 2019. It's Gerald coming right back at you here once again. And I'll tell you what, my trip wouldn't be complete without one of the premier computer accessory, audio equipment, just all over galore as far as 
different consumer electronic products, one of the, the leaders in the industry. And here today is with Blue Hillary as far as well, Blue Microphones, my gosh. You know, when it comes to Blue Microphones and a lot of streamers out there, they certainly want to know what you have to offer, especially, I guess, a new recent announcement? Yes, so at the show this year, we just announced Ember, which is a $99 XLR microphone. So people who want to upgrade or maybe are decking out their home studios with XLR gear for YouTube, podcasting, streaming, music, we're introducing Ember. It's a condenser microphone, so you're going to get that rich, warm studio quality sound. It's cardioid, which is directional to the front. It's a little more precise pickup pattern, so you're gonna, it's going to help you reduce background noise or key click pickups for anyone who's creating content at home. Now this obviously, from what I'm seeing, is a step up from what I'm used to seeing from blue microphones because obviously this snowball and, and you know previous iterations and, and everybody seems to have a blue microphone when I see them streaming online. How satisfying is it from what, you're, what you've been doing in the past and how much better is it releasing now in the blue Ember XLR? So, great question. So, yes, we have really seen a lot of people embrace the brand and the microphones to create content. And now we're just we're now we're now just offering a wider variety. So, Blue's been making studio microphones since 1995. Uh, and now we have products like Ember, which are at a more accessible price point. We've seen a lot of streamers, we've seen a lot of YouTubers, we've seen a lot of podcasters uh, expand their studio with more professional gear. Some people still love and, and it's great quality plug and play USB mics from Blue. And then other people uh, want to expand to mixers and audio interfaces. So to be able to offer a microphone like Ember that's XLR at $100 just gives people more options from Blue when they're putting their studios together at home. You sound like uh, something that you're describing between myself and my co-host Josh that lives in the Orange County area. He's always attached to like a different mixer board with, with different sets. It takes him about 10, 20 minutes to go ahead and find that right configuration. Me, on the other hand, USB, plug in, I'm on my way. So obviously this sounds like a happy medium for both of us. Yeah, so there's options for everybody. USB mics have all that studio gear built in right into them. With Yeti, you can adjust gain and your pickup patterns and direct monitoring. And then it's people like your co-host who, who want all that gear and options like Ember will be able to add to that. There's other microphones that you have out as well, although obviously the Ember XLR is taking the front and center. There's still other great microphones that you have to offer as well, correct? Yes, we came out with Yeti Nano in the fall. So Yeti Nano is a more streamlined version. It's a smaller form factor, but has the same great audio quality as Yeti, but for someone who maybe doesn't want the big size or wants to travel with it more, we still have the Snowball line, Yeti, Yeti Pro. So we have a ton of options. We're demoing a lot of them at the booth with the records this year. Uh, and so Blue has options for any desire feature set, price points. We offer what we hope is a mic to fit the needs of anybody who's about to create content. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome because, you know, like you said, with the Yeti, which is now so synonymous with the streaming scene and has been used and seen on countless streams, countless podcasts, the, the bi-directional, omnidirectional features that it has, and the fact that it's been so much a part of the streaming scene. It's now nice to see the other options from Blue, maybe not necessarily taking its place, but adding more options for the user out there. Yeah, exactly. And Yeti is still best-selling USB microphone. It really is the, the king of the mic of the internet. It's the, it's the king of USBs. But not everybody needs all those features. Not everybody wants that price point. And not everybody maybe wants that form factor. And so we offer a variety of options for people because everybody has different needs and, and different preferences. Now, I know a lot of the units are available today. I see a lot of Best Buy, Amazon, others brick and mortar retailers, but if somebody wants to find out more information on all the great microphones that you have, including the Blue Ember XLR, where do they need to go to? They can go to bluedesigns.com. Well, that's awesome. Hillary, I want to thank you so much. Kind of caught me off guard here until I realized it's not only just Logitech, Astro, Ultimate Ears, Jaybird, Logitech, yeah, that's great, but it's also Blue Microphones here, all in one big happy family right here at Pepcom. I'm so, like I said, so used to seeing you at such a larger venue on the floor, 
putting on some tunes, got the DJ on the records and all that. So a pleasure to talk to you as always, and I appreciate so much you taking time to talk to me here tonight. Thank you. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Well, now I've moved over to the Phone Soap location right here at Pepcom and CES 2019. I'm here with Dan Barnes, and he's going to tell me why, well, everybody out there that has a smartphone, a cell phone of any type that's out there, needs phone soap. Your cell phone is 18 times dirtier than a public restroom. In fact, it's become a third hand that we never wash. Uh, I'm just shaky right now holding my cell phone interviewing as we speak. (laughs) That's exactly right. It's a bit frightening. Uh, The problem is it's never clean, and it's stored in dark, warm places so that bacteria can actually continue to grow on the cell phone. So what we have here is a device that disinfects your cell phone using UVC light, the safest and most effective way to clean your phone. It works 99.99% every time, and it also simultaneously charges your phone. So every night you're going to charge your phone, put it in phone soap, charge it, disinfect it at the same time. Sweet. Now... What is used in the process of trying to clean it out, if I may ask, besides, is it just UV lights or...? That's exactly right. That's all it is. It's UVC light, proven technology. We just shrunk it down and made it accessible to the consumer. The short wavelengths penetrate the cell wall and effectively kill it. So again, it's really the safest way because it's not going to damage your phone, but it will kill the bacteria every time. Now, do you have different sizes of this phone soap? Because looking at it now, and if you take a look at the, the Pop Culture Cosmos social media, you'll see it as well. I want to ask you about this when it comes to phone soap. Are these cases sized to a standardized phone, or is it to something similar based off of Apple or, let's say, Android phones? Yeah, great question. I think the best answer is it'll fit the iPhone X Max with a case on it. So it's meant for the biggest phones. What you see on the table here are three different units. One just charges and sanitizes. The next charges, but it does so with Qi wireless technology. So you just drop your phone in and it will charge it wirelessly. The third one is our brand new, basically battery powered. It's like a power bank that also disinfects your phone. So you can take it with you while you travel on an airplane in your hotel or while you're camping and you can disinfect your phone or heck, whatever fits inside. Toothbrush, headphones, a fork, whatever it is. And that's something that's very important out there because I will tell you, and I'll be honest with you, my wife in the past couple months has really gotten a hold of power banks, yep. really gotten used to using them. And, and, yes. and they, you know, every, she takes it wherever she goes with it. So I understand now the great need to not only just have that extra battery power, but to also sanitize it at the same time. That's right. This version is always ready to go. It's 6,000 milliamps, so it can charge your phone a few times or do up to 45 disinfecting cycles. Sweet, sweet. Now, last question I got for you, and then obviously it's the most important one. Where can somebody find out more about information on it, prices, whatnot, and, and where do they need to go to in order, if, you know, if they're interested in buying a phone soap? Yeah, the best place is going to be our website, phonesoap.com. It'll have the most information. But of course, everyone loves Amazon. We're available there also. Do you have a price range on any yes, of them? Yes, of course. Our standard version is $60. That charges it with a cord and also disinfects. Our Phone Soap Go, that's our portable version. It's $80. It comes with a carrying case. And finally, our wirelessly charging version is $100. Oh, that's awesome indeed. And that's, again, phonesoap.com? Yeah, phonesoap.com. All right. you got to remember that name when it comes yeah. to not only cleaning your phone, but charging it as well. That's right. Dan, I want to thank you so much for being a part of the show and just taking time to tell us about the, all the great things going on at Phone Soap. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we're back right here at Pepcom and CES 2019, and I'm stopping by for some great sound because I'm here at the THX booth. I'm here with David Pergoda. That's right, I got it right. All right, I'm doing good this year, I'm telling you. David, it's a pleasure to have you a part of the show. I want to ask you real quick, THX is synonymous with awesome and incredible audio experience each and every time. Movies, home theater, you name it. Tell me what THX is up to here at CES. Sure. So, I, like you mentioned, THX is about high fidelity audio and visual quality. So, we believe everyone should enjoy that experience, not just people who spend you know thousands and thousands of dollars on their gear, right? We're trying to bring that audiophile, high-end, high-fidelity experience to everyone. And here at Pepcom and at CES in general, we're really talking about two major products that we've uh, announced here in 2018, going into 2019. The first is THX Spatial Audio, we're really excited about. 
So what we're trying to do is bring ultra immersive entertainment experiences to consumers across their devices and content. So this is um, THX Spatial Audio is being integrated into gaming headsets. We're also looking beyond surround sound and channel based formats to using higher order ambisonics in a new um, container and file format called MPEG-H. So we're working with Qualcomm on that. Really excited about what that's gonna do to consumers to bring ultra immersive, high fidelity audio and visual entertainment through streaming and broadcast ways. So China, Korea have already adopted it. The ATC in the US has already adopted it. So MPEG-H is really gonna be revolutionary in terms of that next step in entertainment where just your average consumer is gonna be able to enjoy this content and have more control of it and get more audio information. So th things like customizing which microphones you're listening to in a stadium when you're watching a soccer or football game. You know, turning off commentators and just enjoying the ambience of the stadium. Things like that we're really excited about. And for gaming, you know, what that's gonna do is give our gaming friends ultra immersive pinpoint accuracy of where sounds are coming from. So whether it's competitive gaming, you know, first person shooter, or, um, you know, a, a fantasy type game, just the sound quality is amazing and you can really customize that as a user to get exactly the sound that you want. Could be a game like in a, in a horror genre, something like that where you're, you're, you have to have your senses on high alert and checking all around you as far as it's concerned. Something could just pop out right behind you. Exactly. And then the second product that we're really excited about, which has already started rolling out to consumers, is our AAA headphone amplifier technology. So AAA stands for achromatic audio amplifier, achromatic meaning colorless. So we're not trying to add anything to the sound coloration in terms of frequency response, things like that. What we're trying to do is give the cleanest possible amplification to any headphones that you're using. So this, this technology can be integrated into Bluetooth headphones and it will have the absolute lowest amount of distortion, noise uh, available on the market today. We've already announced products with both Mastrop, Monoprice, and Benchmark. Um, on the high-end side, and this technology will be rolling out to both audiophile products and then mainstream products like think of headsets and you know mobile devices globally. Now I know you. Well, I'm gonna say I'm gonna guess that you've had a good chance, to, you know, an opportunity to to try out some of this in detail. So, in your own words, you know, I know you've told me exactly everything that's going on with THX, but in your own words. How have these experiences changed you as far as what you listen to and how you experience it? You know, it, it's amazing that how quickly technology is evolving, right? And I think what I really want to see and what I'm the most excited about is bringing this immersive technology to any consumer, right? Not just the high end, it should be simple, it should be easy to use and it should be everywhere and work with any kind of content. So whether it's our amplifiers or our software, you know, spatial audio, which is an end-to-end -end platform both on content capture side and then the playback and rendering side, we're really excited to just bring this technology to, you know, people globally and at a scale where it's easy to use and it's in your favorite device. So whether it's a mobile device or your high-end gaming system or your, your state-of-the-art home theater system, you're getting the best out of all of that technology. Now, whether you're an audiophile or a regular consumer, possibly even like me, that's out there that wants to know more about what's going on with all this technology, whether it's your brand or whether it's something that you're working in coordination with, with another company, how do they find out more about all this awesome information? Sure, for the latest and greatest, you can go to THX.com. You can also follow us um, on all the social media channels, including LinkedIn, and the, the handle is uh, THXLTD, so at THXLTD, and uh, thanks, we appreciate it. David, it's been awesome talking to you. I cannot wait to experience some of this myself because I'll tell you what, I'm so excited for that different kind of experience right around the corner from THX. Absolutely, thanks, Joe, appreciate it. Thank you again, appreciate it. If you're tired of sifting through flea markets for rare and unique games, we can help. Retro City Games in Henderson, Nevada, only five minutes from the Las Vegas Strip, has all your favorite gaming staples, classics, and a wide selection of rare games with new stuff always appearing on our shelves. Come in and chat with Nicole or Doug about your love of games and watch as they help you complete your collection or find your childhood favorite. And don't forget, Retro City Games loves trade-ins. So if you have any Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, Xbox, PlayStation, or even PC games, come in and visit Retro City Games today. Welcome to the new metropolis of gaming, Retro City Games. And we're back to close out the show. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. If you need a listing of where we're at because we're being played on radio, all over the world with two brand new shows twice a week, which are getting replayed every single day of the week 
Check out our listings, which are available right now on their Facebook page, Pop Culture Cosmos, plus also our Twitter and Instagram as well. Josh, I know you got a great thing going on with Humanica Media, so maybe not necessarily update us on what's going on with the new shows coming out with Humanica Media, but what are they going to see when it comes to HumanicaMedia.com? I'm still working on it right now, but I mean, you can see all the latest videos. There's an actual video feed of everything we've been working on, and you can kind of it's like a hub for all the podcasts and all that topic apocalypse episodes and it's a lot cleaner than it used to be you can find prices if you're look in the market for uh wedding films or you know if you just need social media promos filmed all that information is going to be up there so yeah just check it out www.humanicanmedia.com my friend before we close out the show i just want to thank again the folks at cavalier audio blue microphones snackbot phone soap and thx what a great experience CES was this year. And then also Rob McCallum for stepping into the middle of the Cosmic Crossfire once again. So I was going to ask you, when you went to CES, what stood out the most to you? Like, what is what is some tech that you saw that you think is going to be big in the coming years? And I think green technology was probably the one thing that I noticed almost pretty much across the board that really started to stand out is that a lot of companies are more aware of the environment and the effects of the air electronics on the environment. So it seemed like green technology was a point of emphasis at almost every major turn when I went at CES. All right, my friend, before we head on out, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on with the, the shows that we were talking a little bit about on our Friday program. The anti-heroes, the shows that, that I was kind of maybe a little bit down on in uh, Friday shows, I'm a little bit higher on after seeing three of them already over the course of the weekend when it concerns the Umbrella Academy, Doom Patrol, and I've also got a lot of great things to say when it comes to Deadly Class. So I caught the first two episodes of Umbrella Academy, and I'm into it. I really like it. My my one complaint about it is that there's a lot of time jumps, and one of the characters, he's a big muscly guy. You know, that's his superpower is that he's super ripped, and the muscles on him look so fake, and it drives me nuts anytime I see it. But other than that, like, it's a good show. Like, it's a mixture of Kingsman and Hellboy. Wow, that is saying something, because I know how high you were on it. To me, Doom Patrol looks like it's a clear upgrade over what we've seen with Titans. And like you said, the Umbrella Academy really is sticking in the landing when it comes to the show, at least so far from what I've seen as well. When it comes to one more show I want to comment on, when I spoke earlier this month to Jessica Box about Deadly Class on Sci-Fi, I said it was pretty good, but I think it was going to be a show where it was going to be more noted by the individuals that are the stars because those characters are really good and they have a lot of charisma and promise over the course of time, especially in this latest episode. It really is one of the best episodes I've seen so far on television this year, and it is really good. It's episode five for Deadly Class. It really kicked the show up a notch, and I thought it went for me as a whole for the series from a good show to a really, really good show and almost at the level of maybe what you would want to say is Umbrella Academy and also Doom Patrol as well. So all three of those shows right now are, I don't want to say must watch, but they are shows that if you're in a fix to find out what you want to go ahead and see and you got some time, you might want to give one, two, or all three of those shows, the Umbrella Academy, Doom Patrol, and Deadly Class of Shot, Dead in Class on Sci-Fi, Doom Patrol on the DC Universe, and also Umbrella Academy, of course, on Netflix. So hopefully you'll give them a chance. You'll get to check them out. And I think they're really good watches. And I hope everybody gives Deadly Class, Umbrella Academy, and Doom Patrol a chance. What are your thoughts out there on Umbrella Academy, Doom Patrol, and also Deadly Class as well? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, popculturecosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode. Cannot thank you enough for hanging in there with me. Any last thoughts on the way out? I have been playing Resident Evil 2 Remake, and I do want to revisit that conversation about survival horror games and how they are great tools for expanding your mind when it comes to gaming and I, I do want to have that conversation again so stay tuned for that absolutely we'll go ahead and maybe it might even be a pcc extra you never know or on our friday show where we'll be talking about and i'm sure 
Josh and I will be arguing about the upcoming Train Your Dragon 3, which is doing great overseas and finally lands in theaters here in the U.S. this weekend. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the pop culture cosmos. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great day. Let's talk about the Flopcast. Where every week we drink a lot of coffee and we talk about comic books, movies, conventions, music, Saturday morning cartoons. Oh, don't forget the coffee. Lots of weird, obscure pop culture stuff from the 70s and 80s. And chickens. Yeah, chickens. This will be the stupidest half hour of your week. We guarantee it. You can find us on the ESO Network. And... Flopcast.net. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network. Your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. TangentBoundNetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.